Welcome to the Brockton Historical Society. Um, my name is Nicole Casper. I am the president of the society, and I also work at Stonehill College as the director of the archives. Um, we're going to start our talk tonight today. Um, I entitled this The Spanish Flu and the End of World War I in Brockton. It's not very original, but it was all I could come up with. Um, the idea of this talk came um, from Jim Benson. Again, he liked to assign me things to do. Um, who was our former president, um, and I was like, yeah, it sounds interesting. I didn't really fully realize or understand the wealth of information that was available, and I knew that the topic of World War I was going to be huge. I figured if I counted on the end of World War I, it would be great, but even then, there was a lot of information. And so as I was getting ready to do this, um, I've struggled to keep it under an hour, um, but I did, so you don't have to worry. <laughs> Um, but the bulk of my talk is going to focus pretty much on the last four months of 1918. Um, but before I get to there, I do want to bounce back a little bit to the spring of 1917. So, um, world War I um, started in 1914, so by 1917 the world had been at war for three years. But the U.S. had remained neutral, and President Woodrow Wilson had actually campaigned and, re and won re-election in November 1916 with the slogan, He Kept Us Out of War. Brockton in, in 1917 was a bustling city with a population of almost 65,000 people. As one would expect, manufacturing industries made up a large part of the city's economy, and shown here, you can see some of those industries as this was taken from the 1910 federal census showing the industries in Brockton. Um, there were over 200 different uh, establishments that were manufacturing industries. Um, shown here you can see um, on a lot of them that the, the shoes were actually, it just doesn't say shoes, it breaks it down into different categories. Um, on April 2nd, one month after his second inauguration, Woodrow Wilson asked for a resolution of war against Germany. And the request was granted, and the United States was at war as of April 6, 1917. Shown here is the front page of the April 6 edition of the Brockton Enterprise. And you will see that it basically says America in the World War. Page 2 shows the details of a great parade that was held by the city upon learning the news, with over 40,000 in attendance from the surrounding area in, and Brockton. So they basically, and it's, if you read this carefully and you read some of the other articles, about 10,000 people participated in this parade in addition to the 40,000 um, that were celebrating. So it was a really great celebration that the, America had finally joined the World War. On page 13 of the same edition, it pro proclaims that all single men were to be registered. The Selective Service Act, aka the Selective Draft Act, was actually enacted to, uh, a month later on May 18, 1917, and required all men between the ages of 21 and 30 to register with locally administered draft boards for military conscription by national lottery. The age limits for the draft were later extended to include all men between the ages of 18 and 45, and it would be canceled after the end of the war. These World War II dra one draft cards are an amazing resource for genealogical research, and are now available um, on Ancestry.com and other genealogical sites. Um, but if you have a relative who lived in this time who was male, most likely you will find their World War I draft card. Over the next several months and years, um, thousands of men in Brockton enlisted or were drafted. And Brockton's industries prospered. One of the first manufacturers to receive a government contract was the Sterling Motor Corporation, located at 705 Center Street, which received an order in April for a million one-pound shells. So in addition to shoes, which we always knew that Brockton provided a lot of the re um, resources for the Army, they were also providing military weapons. And I did not know that we had a Sterling Motor Corporation, so that was very interesting. The first Brockton soldier to die in the war is believed to be er Errol William Barnard, Barnard who succumbed to pleurisy on April 2nd, April, excuse me, April 12th, 1917. He had enlisted in the Navy in February of 1917 at the age of 17. And yes, there were a lot of 17s in that sentence. 
He would, of course, not be the only casualty, as Brockton boys served with distinction, but that is not the topic of this talk, maybe in the future. So I'll fast forward my story to March of 1918, when sporadic reports of flu-like illnesses were first reported in the United States. In April, the first mention of influenza appeared in the weekly public health report published by the Surgeon General. It stated simply, on March 30th, 1918, the occurrence of 18 cases of influenza of severe type, of which three deaths resulted, was reported at Haskell, Kansas. However, it would not be until late August the disease would begin its deadly assault on the state of Massachusetts. According to, re to a report on the epidemic published by the city, the first case of Spanish influenza became known on Commonwealth Pier in Boston on August 28, 1918. A sailor from a receiving ship suddenly took ill and the attending physician pronounced the illness as Spanish influenza. Three days later, the same physician was stricken. On the same day, a Brockton boy home on furlough was seen by Dr. F. Elmore Constance. On September 3rd, the health officer, Fred J. Ripley, also saw this unidentified patient and the case was diagnosed definitively as influenza and was, according to this report, the first case in Brockton, although it soon spread. However, it is not until after the Red Sox beat the Cubs in Game 6 of the World Series on September 11, 1918, that influenza really began its deadly assault on Brockton. And since the, now, the Red Sox are now World Series champs 100 years later, and since I wrote this on the day of the rolling rally, I thought I would give a few little bit of information about this series. The series was held early in 1918 because, the, uh, because of the war, and in fact is the only World Series that was played entirely in the month of September. Game one in Chicago was the first time the national anthem was played at a World Series game. It, had been, it was played by a band from the, Na the Navy training station north of Chicago during the seventh inning stretch. Now the national anthem had played at major league games prior to this, but this was the first time um, it was played where all players took off their caps and faced the flag, with the exception of Red Sox infielder Fred Thomas. Thomas had been granted a furlough to play, as had many other, other players, and he kept his cap, cap on and gave a military salute. The news of the Red Sox that had won the world championship was reported on page six of the Enterprise on September 12th. And that was the article. Um, it was very interesting. It was not the big headlines that they had won, as it was 100 years later. Of course, no one knew back then it would be many years before they would win again. <laughs> so back to the flu. According to the Brockton Enterprise, the first death from the flu occurred on September 10th. There were two deaths recorded that day, one for a one-month-old baby who died from indigestion, and one for Mary Rooney who died from lobar pneumonia. Which, is often, which often developed due to the flu and is actually often listed as the cause of death. And this is her death certificate. The next death um, was that of Herman Cohen, who died at his home at 306 Spring Street on September 15, having been sick since September 11th. And you can see that he also died of pneumonia, but the um, contributory was um, influenza. Carolyn Bellman died at Brock on September 16th. Carolyn Bellman died at Brockton Hospital, and deaths begin to be report begin to be reported in the Brockton Enterprise. So you'll see that at least you know. You would think that this is a big epidemic and things like that, but the Brockton Enterprise um, begins to report it several days after we had several victims in Brockton. By the end of September, more than 85,000 people in the state of Massachusetts would contract influenza, and in the last week of September alone, 700 died. In Brockton, thousands were inflicted. On September 18th, the Brockton Enterprise reports that 1,000 were stricken. Oh, no. A thousand were stricken with the disease, including 500 students. And one of those students would, who would succumb would be Mary Tuig, an 18-year-old 
high school student. On September 20th, the Enterprise printed this advice from the Boston Globe. And that's highlighted there. It's titled, While the Grip Rages About Us. And here it is. Tip on the grip. How to avoid. Get plenty of sleep and don't overwork. Keep out of crowds. Keep the bowels free. Spray the throat and nose twice a day with any good alkaline solution. Even salt and water will do. How to recognize. First, there is a chill, headache, backache, and then a fever of a temperature of 101 to 103. Reddening and running of eyes, pains and aches all over the body, and general prostration. How to treat. Go to bed and order a doctor. Rest, fresh air, and abundant food. Dover powders for the relief of pain. So Dover powders, of course I had to look that up because I'd never heard of it. And there's a slide. So these are Dover powders. And I'm not sure if you can see it, but basically the main ingredient is opium. So basically, if you were sick, take some opium and go to bed. And have a doctor come to your house because that's what they did at that time. If you were really sick, you would go to the hospital, and Brockton Hospital was quickly taxed to capacity as every ward was put into service, even as the disease, disease spread to doctors and nurses. And with the deaths would come tragic stories. Miss Margaret Breslin, a shoe worker, died on what was to be, was to be her wedding day. And so this is Margaret's, um, her death certificate, and you can see her cause of death is la grip is how they put it. Um, death certificates were very interesting, and of course you can see underneath that um, she had pneumonia was a contributory factor. Going through the death certificates, um, they are online if you go to First Search, um, um, a website called First Search, no, excuse me, Family Search. Um, they, they are online, and so what I did was I found one death and then I was able to scroll through all of the deaths um, in Brockton. Trying to figure out if they were actually an influenza death was interesting, um, because it didn't always say, and they, each death certificate says it in di different ways. Sometimes it says influenza, this one happened to say La Grip. sometimes it says Spanish influenza, sometimes it just says influenza. It, it was very interesting, there was no consistency whatsoever. Also interestingly enough, at this time, um, it wasn't until into, well into the epidemic that flu-related flu illnesses actually had to be recorded. Um, or deaths have to be recorded to any state level. And the next slide just shows um, about, is a headline, I don't know if sure if it shows, about her dying on her wedding day. In addition to the tragic stories of, of young love being thwarted, whole families were also devastated. And one story that stuck out to me was that of the Pacelli family Laredo Parcelli and his wife Mary died on September 20th, within hours of one another. Three of their children also died. Joseph, age 14. Alphonse, age 7. Oh, excuse me. Joseph died on September 24th at age 14. Antonio at age 4 on September 25th. And Alphonse at age 7 on September 27th. Only two children in the family survived, Amelia, age 11, and Constantino, age 1. They would go on to live with their aunt and uncle. But what's tragic is the family had actually only come from Italy five years before in 1913. The numbers of ill were so great that private hospitals, which were numerous in Brockton, also opened to the sick. Dr. George A. Moore opened his private hospital located at 167 Newbury Street for the treatment of influenza and pneumonia patients. In the past, the hospital had been devoted primarily to surgical and a few obstetric cases. And the illnesses did not discriminate. Charles Chester Eaton, head of the C.A. Eaton Company and one, um, and one of the ward council advisors of shoes um, to the government and a member of Brockton School Board was stricken along with his wife, although both would survive. On Saturday, September 21st, um, the paper reported 22 dead, 5,000 sick, and doctors were collapsing from overwork. However, the illness did not keep the city from promoting its war drive with a parade that same day. So if you remember a, few, a little bit, I just said that one of the treatments was to stay out of crowds. 
um, and yet the city decided to still hold its parade. And as you can see, thousands participated. Um, and they were having, they were promoting their war drive, so they were raising funds um, for war efforts. However, on Monday, next slide, schools get closed because there had been 14 deaths that occurred over the weekend. So it was a little bit back and forth of, you know, and at that point, earlier, as I was doing research, they, were, they had been debating about whether or not the need to close schools and things like that to help contain the illnesses. Um, there was also um, questions about the factories as well. On Wednesday, September 25th, now remember this is also all within 15 days because the first death only occurred on September 10th. On Wednesday, September 25th, the, um, the governor of the state ordered the general closing of all gathering places. And at this point, the mayor ordered the closing of the city theaters. There was also a much discussion on whether churches should close. Clergymen, however, were reluctant. And Reverend Joseph Cooper, pastor of the Central Methodist Episcopal Church, was quoted as saying, I think there is less danger of spread of disease in the church than in the factories of the city or the moving picture houses. I'm not sure why, I guess, you know, people were, had faith or something, but I thought that was an interesting quote. Um, but even as more deaths were reported, this was also the time of the Brockton Fair it was supposed to open at the end of September, and there were several reports of, of moving on with the Brockton Fair. However, between September 10th and September 25th, 85 people were reported to have died from the flu of related illnesses with lists of the dead being published almost daily. Mayor Gleason, believing the epidemic would last several more weeks into the middle of October, wired the Surgeon General requesting that Dr. Moore and Dr. Walter Fullerton not be called to report to the Army as ordered. Dr. Moore had received a commission and had orders to report to duty no later than October 15. So now the city was worried not, not only did they not have enough doctors, but several of their doctors were to report for war service. As far as I can determine, the request was granted. However, there was one article that talked about Dr. Moore recovering, so he himself actually got sick. The Brockton Fair was finally called off two days before it was set to begin. Now remember, the governor had already ordered the closing of all gathering places, but they still, I guess, thought that the Brockton Fair could go on. All the arrangements had been made, and immediately wires were sent to countless exhibitors, but as you can imagine, many were already in the city for the event, including herds of cattle and horses. Um, and so everybody had to be packed up and turned around. I wasn't able to determine in, my re in the, the limited research I did if there were people in the city for the Brockton Fair that were also turned ill, I didn't see anybody um, on any of the death certificates where that were from out of state. On Monday, September 30th, so 20 days after the first death, the Enterprise reported that 8,000 cases had been reported in the city with 99 deaths. So I tried to calculate 8,000 was approximately about 12% of the city's population had been afflicted with the flu. If we go on about that 65,000 number. On October 2nd, it was reported that the worst stage had passed the city. Um, in, addition, the more in addition to the Moore Hospital, other emergency hospitals were begun to set, be set up, including the old YWCA building and the old Goddard Hospital. The new Goddard Hospital had been opened early in mid-September due to the epidemic. So Goddard, the new Goddard Hospital had been being built and they canceled all of the um, celebrations regarding its opening and just opened it for patients. The YWCA building, the old one had been closed right around September 10th as the new w YWCA building had been dedicated. And there were a lot of articles on, on the dedication of that building. So here they had big buildings and they immediately tried to use them as places to put patients. But for those patients who did not go to hospitals, the Visiting Nurses Association did yeoman's work from, from going from house to house and what the newspaper called volunteer autos. Here should be a slide. 
called the angels of the epidemic, it was reported they worked from dawn to at least midnight and sometimes until 2 a.m. caring for the sick and reporting critical cases. So they would go from house to house, and they would identify people who were sick, and then they would arrange and determine whether they needed to go to the hospital. The volunteer autos belonged to everyday citizens who volunteered to drive the nurses or transport the sick to hospitals. And they often worked all night, giving up vacations and days off. One person who was reported to do this was a man by the name of um, Leonard Buchanan, who was a hoseman on Squad A of the fire department, who himself had just recovered from the illness. In addition, Mrs. D.W. Field's car was put into service, being driven on the night shift, and George, George E. Keith provided his chauffeur to help transport people. Interestingly enough, obviously this is 1918, autos were not as abundant as they are today, and transportation was difficult. In fact, early in those years, the city directories actually had a section that would list all the people who owned automobiles in the city as well. As with today, there is no cure for the flu and only treatments. And this headline shows an operation that was given to Miss Agnes G. Ryan, who, who basically had a tube put down her throat so she could breathe. So it was obviously she had developed a pneumonia. So this was one of the treatments, and she did survive. And of course, with there no, being no cure, there were lots of treatments. So, next slide. This is a treatment and it says to remember um, the three C's. So this is an ad that was put out. This is a, about a quarter page ad that was in the enterprise. And it basically calls for people to have clean mouths, clean clothes, and clean skin. skin. Yeah, so basically telling people to wash <laughs> was basically what they thought um, was to do. So. Um, and businesses were also trying to spare their employees. Obviously, factory workers were taken ill. It was reported that many of the shoe companies were um, down. Um, at one point, the local telephone service was down to one operator. And so, to keep it from spreading, some of the companies took drastic measures. One such was the company called the Everlasting Company of Prospect Hill, which wrote to London, who had seen its own fair share of suffering the illness, for any recipes for prevention and received the following. Henry Turner, the superintendent of the company, said that London physicians say they do not know of a single, Spanish, single case of Spanish flu where the following recipe was used. Now this was a preventative, not a cure. So this was for people who hadn't gotten the flu. The recipe calls for three to five drops of cassia oil into a little brandy to dissolve the oil and then to add milk or hot water and take two to three times a week before bed. Now, I had to look up what cassia oil is because I hadn't heard about it. And basically, it's essential oil that you actually can still get today. It's more of an herbal remedy um, to be used. I just like the fact that you had to dissolve it in brandy, to just, you know, put it into brandy to dissolve the oil, and then add milk or hot water um, and take two to three times a bed. There is no follow-up on whether this worked for the Everlastic um, company employees or not. However, probably more effective was the plans that they would air out and disinfect the factories in between, overnight in between shifts. Um, so, and they actually didn't use the word fumigate was the term of the day. So at this point in my story, we're basically still only um, a month, less than a month into the epidemic. And, our next slide. Oh, keep going. And next slide. So here we go. We actually, on October 4th, they decided to create a field hospital. The Brockton Field Hospital was announced, and it was going to be a 200-bed, 10 hospital, just outside Brockton Hospital, um, that was to care exclusively for the epidemic patients. And it opened on October 5th. And here, very few photos exist from this time period. Most of these obviously come from the Brockton Enterprise. But these, the following are a few of the photos that exist. So the following is just a bigger view of the tent hospital, and you can see it had different sections. Um, the next slide is more of a closer up view, and these are um, some of the workers who, um, it was actually the National Guard who established and erected all the tents. 
The next slide shows um, a nurse and one of the National Guardsmen holding a baby as, in front of what was known as the children's ward. And one of the articles, it was about three or four weeks, about three weeks in before it was determined that all caregivers needed to wear masks to help um, prevent them from getting the, the influ influenza. It was also around the first week of October that the benefit of sun baths was, was touted to show, um, help patients recover from the flu. And so the next slide, it's very difficult to see. It's basically people are on the roof of the new YWCA building getting fresh air and getting a sun bath. Now, if you think about it, they put in a field hospital. It's October. You don't know what the weather was like. And then they wanted them to go sit out in the sun in October. So I think the next time I do this, I need to um, actually look at what the weather was because I would think it was a little chilly to be outside. But, um, but sun baths were a big, big thing. So fresh air. It was also this week, the, or the following week after the hospital was put up, the Enterprise reported the flu was on the wane. Okay, the next slide. You can see there. Um, and was it, it probably was, people still continued to die, but the amount of cases began to lessen. Um, but the city had turned the tide, and on October 15th, it was reported that schools and, the and theaters would, would open the following week. So basically, in five weeks, the city um, suffered one of its worst epidemics, but began to um, recover within that time to be able to open up, up, up excuse me, up theaters. Next slide. So you can see that's the slide where they say they'll be able to open up the, the schools. And the next slide, um, the following day, the to first total of deaths was recorded and it was, or reported, and it was 317. So in five weeks, 317 people had died from the flu in Brockton. However, it wasn't until September 17th that the flu epidemic even raided front page news. So we, when we talk about the, the epidemic, we think it's this huge thing, um, and it really did devastate you know, the city, but it wasn't front page news for the enterprise until seven days after, um, as more deaths occurred. You will also notice, as we, I was flipping through the slides, um, that although the epidemic does finally make the front page, it is never the headline. The headlines throughout the paper constantly were about the war news and Yankee victories. On November 7th, the Enterprise proclaimed Germany had surrendered and the fighting had stopped. And here is November 11th, a month and a day after Brockton's first flu death. The crisis was over and the city could celebrate the war's end. By this point, there are no stories on the flu epidemic in the paper at all. The, crisis, the armistice, which took effect on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918, on what today we know as Veterans Day, is celebrate its 100th anniversary next, next Sunday. Now, Veterans Day originated as Armistice Day on November 11th, 1919, um, the first anniversary of World War I and Congress passed the resolution in 1926 for an annual observance, and it became a national holiday in 1938. And it has also been one of the only holidays that is celebrated on the actual day rather than being moved to a Monday. The city celebrated again with a parade. So this shows a picture of the parade going down Main Street. Even as bells and whistles tolled from the factories, um, and the, co the cost of the war was not really, it was reported, but it wasn't front page news. So this is one picture of the parade. And this is the next um, article that was on um, a later page that basically reported 55, 54 Brockton lives had been given to the world's cause. This number would actually be very, would be lower than the actual. And over the next several weeks, news of casualties would be received from families of soldiers killed in action during the last weeks of the war or stricken with influenza in various military camps throughout the United States. I found this list online, which is very helpful as part of my research. 
Um, it's put out by genealogy, genealogytrails.com and lists 86 men giving their lives while in uniform in World War I. However, another source that I saw put that Brockton had over 4,000 served during the war with 101 dying in service. There is a book that was put together during the time of the war, which is known as the Honor Roll List. And so I'm working with that to hopefully put that online within the next several months. That was put together by volunteers at the city of Brockton. Orlinus William Barton is believed to be the first Af African American Brockton casualty who died on July 2nd, 1918. He's buried in Melrose Cemetery, but I could not find a cause of his death. As I mentioned earlier, um, our first death was in April. However, those killed in action included, and please forgive me as I butcher these names, Brunan Vichnovich, who was killed October 6, 1918, Captain Max Collins Buchanan killed May 28, 1918, Nathaniel Joseph Carlson killed November 4, 1918, Joseph James Joseph Dexter killed September 29, 1918. Thomas Edward Duffy killed May 16, 1917, and he is believed to be the first Brockton man killed in action. However, many other died, others died from influenza, including Walter James Joseph Brewster, who died September 16, 1918 at the U.S. Naval Hospital in Chelsea. E. Allen Hobart died November 28, 1918, in Norfolk, Norfolk, Virginia. Arthur William Bergen McAvoy died October 19, 1918 at Carnegie Institute. Jacob Julie, Julian took ill in September of 1918 at Kent Upton. Go to that next slide. Oh, another green slide. Next slide. Um, he was nursed by his fiancée no no Naomi Barrett, but she also became ill and died on October 3rd, and he died two hours later. William Francis Clish was home on furlough and died on October 6th. News of fatalities was often slow to be received. In fact, Lester George Chandler was killed in action on September 29th, 1918, but news of his death was not received in Brockton until January 13, 1919. And then there were those who made it through the war but succumbed to influenza. Percy Edward Glenn died on, while home on furlough, um, while home on furlough died in, on December 15th when the Spanish flu made its comeback in Brockton, Easton, and the surrounding towns toward the end of November and into December. According to the Massachusetts mortality statistics, influenza caused 13,783 deaths in the state. And as I mentioned, over 85,000 were inflicted with the disease. In Brockton, 322 people died from influenza in 1918, compared to the 2,974 who died in, Brockton, in Boston. An additional 200 deaths of work in Brockton were from Brockton, Brock, bronchial pneumonia and other pneumonia and other respiratory diseases. It was also, report, also reported which may not also reported which may or may not have been part of influenza. So people died of pneumonia throughout the year, but a lot of them their actual death in the early, in the last four months of the year was pneumonia, not influenza. So we include both of those numbers. So about 500 people in Brockton died of, of influenza. Um, Easton had about 19 influenza deaths and 9 from pneumonia. Whitman had 24 from inf influenza and 30 from pneumonia. Um, Brockton's total death number for the year was 1196. So about half of those, um, just under half of those, were from the influenza epidemic. epidemic. There's no report, um, exact report of how many became ill, although it was likely, most likely, between 6,000 and 8,000 people. At one point, the Enterprise reported that in order to get an accurate count, the postal um, route workers were asked to do an inventory as they delivered the mail. And at that point, that was in late September, and they found 4,600 people ill of the disease. 
The decision to clo close public places probably helped, helped Brockton reduce the number of cases um, because one main cause in December is believed that was people came together at the end of at the end of the war to celebrate the end of World War One. They began to be gathering a lot and pray. You know, they had the parades. They were gathering a lot, and so that was where the rise um, became. It wasn't as bad in East in Brockton um, as it had been. The cases were much milder, and so there weren't as many deaths, although there were still several. Easton was actually greatly aff afflicted um, by the by the epidemic in December, as was Whitman, and both cities closed their schools until the end of the year. Um, Brockton, it does, I don't believe, ended up closing their schools again in, um, in December. Brockton began, began to return to normal as it, began to usher, it, as it prepared to usher in 1919. However, families were forever changed. Eight nurses lost their lives helping the sick. They include Julia, Julia Murley, Georgiana Fleming, Gladys Clark, Mabel Palmer, Doris Morse, Josephine Deenan, Deenan, Nellie Gray, and Winifred Fleming. Brockton had nurses um, come from all over the state, and hundreds of citizens also um, volunteered to help care for the sick, including 50 teachers um, who volunteered as the schools were closed, so they were able to volunteer their time to help. According to the Brockton report that was put out, and I, I must say this Brockton report was written um, in November um, before the resurgence um, occurred. But according to this Brockton report that was put out by the city, during the first week of the epidemic, nurses and doctors reported much suffering in homes for lack of proper food. In many cases, families of six, eight, and 10 members were found sick. In other cases, the mother and father were sick and children were left suffering for food. And friends and rel relatives were also sick or had such a fear of catching the flu that they would not enter the afflicted homes. On September 30th, Mr. It was when the city, this was when they began to make a lot of the plans, uh, Mr. John Scully was placed in charge of the food department and assisted by Lillian Leach to create a list of the needy and Lucy King to purchase and prepare the food. Charles Brooks was in charge of delivery. The high school lunchroom, and this would have been the old high school, um, the high school lunchroom and the domestic science center were both used to prepare and distribute meals, having been given permission by the school committee. That first day, 30 people were furnished with gruel, broth, fresh eggs, and milk and the number increased to a total of 388 people of sick and convalescent, convalescent people on, by October 10th. However, by October 16th, the waning epidemic allowed the kitchen to close, and the remaining 15 families who needed help were turned over to their various churches that they were affiliated with. So it was given back to the churches to help. In addition to those workers, um, they also prepared and delivered food to the two emergency hospitals, which were Goddard and um, the YWCA, and the Brockton Day Nursery, which was caring for children that pa of parents who were afflicted from the disease. So what would happen is if parents went to the hospital and the child wasn't sick, they would actually bring them to the Brockton Day Nursery to be cared for. It is estimated, and these, these numbers are amazing, it is estimated that within 16 days that the kitchen operated, the equivalent of a day's food was delivered to 4,000 people. For 4,000 people was sent to homes, and a day's food for 1,000 patients, nurses, and attendants was sent to the hospitals. This does not include the field hospital, which actually was unable to supply its own food for the first week, and therefore asked the kitchen to provide sandwiches, gruel, broth, bread, and jelly preserves to the patients. The field hospital would only sh operate just short of a month and served about 300 patients, including 40 children. When the resurgence of the flu hit in December, it was mild enough that although it still caused several deaths, the field hospital did not reopen. One reason for this was that Brockton Hospital was able to respond and prevent the, the epidemic and the spreading of the flu. So when the epidemic first happened in September, Brockton Hospital took many of the patients and put them in whatever available wards that were, were open. As a result, 
there was no quarantine, and so it spread to many, um, there was no way to contain it within Brockton Hospital. In December, when they opened it again, they actually um, quarantined. They had learned the benefits of quarantine, so they were able to kind of prevent it a little bit. There are a lot more stories I could share. Um, as I said, it's a huge topic, and it's one I hope to explore much further. Um, but in order to keep this short, I'll end there. Um, and I will take any questions or comments. If anybody has comments of family members or things like that, I will welcome them. So thank you all for coming. I will say this is our last talk of the year. We will be open on November 18th and December 2nd. Um, we are also having a membership drive currently, and we hope people will become members. We can't have these types of programs or do a lot of research in pre preserving the city of Brockton without members to our society. We are offering a discount, 10% off all memberships, through December 15th. Um, you can do that online at brocktonhistoricalsocietyinc.com, or we have, you can email us at brocktonhistoricalsociety1 at gmail. Dot com um, for an application and we hope that you enjoy our programs and we'll participate further so thank you, thank you.